Alvin, step one, open the door. Satan Dan, I'm going to MacGyver this thing. Step two, enter the code. Oscar is a sick, sicko. 6969. Step three, put our zines on top of the penny savers by the gumball machine. They won't notice coming in. No one looks at the magazines when they open a store. They just open and get ready. Step four, sit in the car with binoculars. And above all, make sure Security John doesn't see us. Okay, that was easier than I thought it would be. Give him those binoculars. Now, the waiting game. <laughs> so you said this one is good? Yes. What happens? The priest sits in a hair shirt, repenting for the sin of lust. A priest enters, stiff and un uncomfortable. He's doing the what now? Priest. It itches! He lays down on the bed. God forgive cruel sick me! And the female werewolf enters. Female werewolf enters. She wears a giant wolf werewolf rubber mask. It should look good. And a totally black costume otherwise. Grr. And her head is transformed into a giant hairy head of a monstrous dog. Grr. And she's otherwise a sexy woman. Grr. With a soul that oozes sensuality. Grr. And he's afraid. I'm afraid! And she licks his foot. Ew. Dude! Why the hell would I do that? Because you're a dog and that's what dogs do. That's a terrible answer! I'm trying for verisimilitude. That's not what we agreed on! You said you wanted to wrestle with sin and do some tongue play. Well, like Michelle Pfeiffer in Batman Returns, Alvin, damn it! Who's gonna want this? You think the dog should look his face? No! You got the werewolf wrong. Have you seen Howling 2, Your Sister is a Werewolf? Nobody has seen that movie. They make it, I don't know, hot! Women werewolves can be hot. I don't care about hot Satan Dan, I care about art, and this is art! God! God! I don't like it, female werewolf. I'm just gonna take myself for a walk. Priest and female werewolf nod in agreement and exit. What happened to do your thing, be beautiful? I take it back, don't be you. For the love of God, never be you. Okay. Okay, it's not like anyone knows we write this stuff, right? Well... Oh, right, Kath knows. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. That explains the dog collar. Oh, God. Wait, you think she wore a dog collar because she likes me? Damn, you're dense. I just figured she's goth. She listened to, I don't know, Bauhaus or The Smiths or Susie and the Banshees or The Cure or Japan. She smoked cold cigarettes. Is her room all dark? Her room is bright. Yep. Her room is bright. There you go. So she really likes me. I'm going to kick your ass, dude. Huh. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Werewolf collar. So hello everyone, my name is Sarah Edmonds and I am the Editor-in-Chief of For Page and Scream magazine. I am here today with John Bray, author of the script St. John of Suburbia, which we had the privilege of publishing in our second issue. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I would love if you could just give us a little summary for our listeners of what the play is about, because it's a fantastic, fantastic piece. Oh, thank you. Um, well, St. John of Suburbia is set over the course of one evening in 1996. In the play, fraternal twins Alvin and Satan Dan have been producing a monster erotica zine said to be the writings of a mystic that uses the alias St. John of God. Alvin has been studying religion and VCR repair at the community college and would rather remain anonymous. Satan Dan could spoil that, or Alvin could blurt it out. The play is a mix of dream and memory. The play reminds us that those who choose to spend time with us despite what we write are more than enough in this fleeting life. Great. So what inspired you to write this play? And if you could just walk us through what the process looked like. Sure. This one, um, every play kind of comes from its own place. I think any writer you ask, any play, novel, poetry, et cetera, um, this one came from a dream. Uh, I had a dream that um, I was in a house that looked like um, my grandmother's old house. 
And in the dream, it was next to a gas station. And I didn't really know the people that were in this dream, but everything was very, very awkward and strange. And so that kind of became the beginning of the play where the central character, Alvin, um is on a date and he's meeting um his um not yet official girlfriend uh Kath's father grandmother and um and sister and when i started writing the piece i thought about you know ways to present the story that wouldn't rely on lights up lights down multiple sets and I like the way the characters talk. So I said, okay, well, why don't they just narrate? And so all the characters narrate throughout. They turn to us, they talk to us, um, they give us some exposition, they tell us what they're thinking. Um, and it will hopefully help keep the production values down for folks who want to produce it on stage, or it could be useful as a Zoom production, it could be an audio drama. And so really trying to keep those values down. But um embracing theatricality at the same time the notion that these characters are talking to us they are breaking the fourth wall they know they're breaking the fourth wall um and we get a bit of their inner lives and it's a convention that i've used and other people have used before but i really leaned into it here and i grew to like these people a lot the more that they kind of spoke out um to the audience um and then the other thing that I tried to do with this is to write a quote unquote nice play that um, my parents, I think of my parents that they've seen my stuff on and off over the years and have said, why don't you ever write a nice play? So here we have it. It's a nice play. You're welcome, mom and dad. Thinking of the section you just read and I'm, I'm questioning that, but. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you have two characters who are really, you know, um, who have convinced themselves so to give a little bit more of perspective for those who haven't read it yet um these two characters work at a deli and then they go to community college and they print their own zines so zines were like photocopied magazines back in the mid-1990s that were independently done you'd find them in coffee shops and delis and record stores and used book stop shops around the front you know you go in and say hey can i leave my zine here, you know, um, multicolored pages, that sort of thing. And um, so these two characters have a zine and they work at a deli and they know that an editor for a big publishing house, which I call Arbitrary Cottages, frequents the competitor's deli. And they know that they can't just ask to leave them there because the competitor would just throw them out. He throws them out. But they really think that if this editor for this publishing house reads one that it will be moved to want to publish their stories and give them a contract. I mean, they've convinced themselves that what they're making is grand art and thus the argument they have. And so they break into the deli, try to put the zines in there. And when Satan Dan realizes that his brother's written something kind of gross, they break back into the deli to steal them back. And that's where the last part of the play happens when they're caught. Um, you know, I think that people are, it's different now, but the 90s, um, you know, uh, young people made mistakes. They, they they would have these grand intentions and do acts of hooliganism, um, but we're seeing as, yeah, it's breaking the law, but it's not like it is now. It was a little bit different in the, I'm, I'm not saying, okay, kids, go knock over a deli. I'm just saying, you know, they're, they're not robbing the place. They're trying to put something in there. Um, but, uh, you know, they're just really, um, they're really not thinking through the larger ramifications of what it could mean to break into a store. Um, and, uh, you know, and that's, that, that could be very dangerous. That's potentially very dangerous. In the 21st century, I mean, oh my God, but 1996, when things were independently owned, you know, the, the, the biggest risk you'd have is that the owner would still be there and have a shotgun on the register side. And you'd be like, oh my God, wait, wait, hold on. Um, but, um, uh, I don't know. Now I'm making myself sound like a latent hoodlum. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to be their lawyer. Your Honor, these two <laughs> young men, they were breaking into a store in the name of art. Uh, you have to do water. what you have to do. 
That's right. <laughs> we are not endorsing break-ins. <laughs> You're not. Oh, God. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> So have you always been drawn to plays as a medium or have you kind of played around with it? No pun intended. <laughs> no, that's right. Um, when my brother and I were in community college, we went to Dutchess Community College in Poughkeepsie, New York. Uh, we both wanted to be filmmakers. It was our dream to go to NYU, actually, but our parents were like, uh, we can't do that. And so, um, you know, kind of a working class town, working class community. So we went across the river to DCC and I wanted to be a filmmaker. I wanted to be a screenwriter and um, I really wanted to work with the camera. I loved working with the camera. Um, and so we were tasked by an advanced class to write a screenplay and kind of develop it out of a screenplay that somebody else had been working on. And so we were kind of brought in and fleshed it out. And um, we were told, um, this is not, a, you haven't written a screenplay, you've written a play. And what what the teachers and the cast, everybody meant is that this is too wordy and people are talking too much. But what I heard was make it a play. So I said, okay. So I rewrote it as a stage play with my brother. And then um, uh, Mike Wida at the um, programming board produced the play at Dutch Community College. So that was my first produced play in 1996. Oh, that's and, awesome. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And that's where I got the bug. And I realized that, oh, if I write a play, we just get a group of people together and we can just do it, you know? And it's much more, it was much easier um, to just have productions that way and to get our work in front of an audience. Um, actually now, in, in, you know, in 2023, it is pretty um, easy to make like an independent film. Like people are making movies on their cell phones and stuff. But in 1996, not so much. Um, you really couldn't do independent cinema without some money behind you. Um, but plays you can do it anywhere. You can have you know great reckonings in little rooms, as uh, Bert State says. And um, and so that's where I got the bug. That's how I got the bug. And I just wanted to keep going, so I did. That's so fantastic. Um, I know personally, I had a little bit of an opposite experience where I did start out with screenplay writing and ended up writing a couple of plays that were small, small productions, historical vignettes, that kind of thing. Um, but they are completely different animals to tackle in very surprising ways to me. It was something I didn't expect coming from film and moving into stage plays. Because to me, they're both visual mediums. You both have characters talking and it's very visually directed. But the difference in approach is really, really interesting. Um, and I feel I feel like I have to offer full disclosure here. When we received St. John of Suburbia, um, we all were worried that it was going to be a little too dialogue heady, just glancing at the page, not reading it. Um, because we get a lot of play submissions that are just characters talking and that is it. And we were blown away. We have everyone on our editorial team absolutely loved it. This is not like a split decision on this play. Oh. We all loved it. Um, and it was really surprising to have people on a stage talking this very minimal approach that you mentioned, but have it work so well. Like it is absolutely meant to be a play. It is not meant to be a short story because we get lots of those. It's like, this would be better as a short story. Uh, absolutely not. It works as a play. It breathes as a play. It lives as a play. So I'm, I'm in love with your use of character and dialogue. I think it works so well. Um, so I guess it's like a branch off question to that. Um, do you feel like the characters come to you with their own voice or do you have to spend a lot of time fleshing it out? Because I know sometimes it can be hard to have characters of similar ages, similar backgrounds and have them sound unique. Do they come to you unique or do you spend time breaking that out? Probably a little bit of both. Um, I think that often when i write a character i see them and it's usually somebody that i know from my own life um sometimes i cast them with like you know al pacino or something like pacino will be in this one day maybe but you know but i kind of cast them um and usually they come to me already cast 
Um, and from there, I think about that person's voice, uh, conversations I've had with that person, the rhythms of their speech, any turn of phrase, and that just organically becomes part of it. Um, and as a writer yourself, you know that sometimes you'll be writing something and you'll look up and realize like, holy cow, th this thing is writing itself. These people are just talking and I'm taking, you know, dictation basically. Um, and so with St. John, it was kind of like that where I was writing and the characters were really the characters were talking and I was just writing down what they're saying. That's not always the case. Uh, sometimes there is a lot of going back and forth and saying, what is this person doing here? They insist on being in the story and they have no place. And that's where you have to learn to either excise them or make them important. Um, but in the case of, of this piece, the characters were, um, pretty well formed beforehand and just need a little bit of nudging in, in different areas. Um, I didn't know that, um, spoilers for those who haven't read it, I didn't know that Security John was going to be the dad until he showed up and he was the dad. And it's like, I didn't see that coming, you know, and that was really, um, really a neat thing. And after that happened, I did go back and make one adjustment earlier on to kind of plant a seed for that possibility um, when I did a revision. But when he just showed up, it's like I I did not know that was going to happen, and that was a really cool, really cool discovery. That's so awesome! I I love those moments where it's like, yes, the characters are writing this. It makes life so much easier. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But you had um, mentioned before about the accessibility of some filmmaking and the accessibility of getting your work in front of people today as compared to 1996. Um, what would you say is the biggest change or benefit that you've seen to like modern technology and getting plays out there, getting films out there? Well, the great thing is there's been a democratization because people can send scripts via email now versus snail mail. Um, folks can upload the short films on YouTube or Vimeo. Um, which gets more clicks, more likes, more of an audience. Um, the, um, so it's much more accessible in a lot of ways. Um, it can still be pricey. My brother and I made a short film, um, which is going into a couple of smaller festivals um, called Escapism. We have an IMDb page for Escapism. And it uh, was shot in a day. We did, but we did it under a SAG after contract. So it did spend, we, it did cost. We had a professional DP, so it did cost, but we were still able to make it in a, you know, basically in a day. And, um, and my brother went with some folks into post and had a great time with it. And so that was, now I'm seeing somebody who, who doesn't have the technical know-how. My technical know-how stops in 1998. So as a, you know, but just as somebody who watches other people do it, it's like, wow, they make it look so easy. Um, but there's so many festivals now. And I think that the means of production have been given back to the artist in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that the pipelines to what was considered success are a little bit easier to access now than they were even 25 years ago. Um Years ago, self-production, whether film or theater, would have been seen as like vanity productions. Um, but now we use the word entrepreneurship, which is a, you know, I guess in some ways a better word. I get worried about some some money-based language, but nonetheless, like the point is artists are doing it themselves. You know, whether you look at playwrights collectives like 13P in New York, um, which pulled the plug 10 years ago, or the welders in Washington, D.C., where playwrights come together as a collective and make sure that each one of the members has a play produced on a certain timeline um, by that company. Or if you look at individual playwrights like um, Rich Olorf um, produces his own work. Or, um, you know, I think the hardest thing for any of us is just money. Is that um, how do we find money to do the work that we do? And that's always going to be a question. But I do think because of the technologies now available, that it's become a little bit easier to make creative choices when you don't have money. Yeah, absolutely. I always heard advice through my cinema program when I was in school that the hardest part about becoming a filmmaker 
is just making the film, getting out there and doing it. And I'm incredibly grateful at the technological advances that have made it more accessible. Like we learned about actually splicing film and I'm like, thank goodness I don't have to do that. <laughs> Where did you go to film school? Um, actually, it was just McDaniel College down in Maryland. It's not technically a film school. They just have a pretty small cinema program, but it's right kind of between like Gettysburg, Baltimore and DC. So I, my freshman year, I actually worked on a film set in Annapolis as like an internship that was so invaluable. It was like this feature film that had actual stars in it that I didn't know. I got like, the internship by a uh, recommendation from one of my professors and I messaged the film's fake Facebook page and I was like, hey, do you need help? And they were like, sure, show up at this abandoned news office like okay ah. <laughs> the whole film was shot in um the former S sun newspaper building okay. i believe it was um it's called the night watchman i don't know it's cheesy clown vampires <laughs> um but i love that kind of stuff so <laughs> but yeah that was the first film set I ever worked on and it was trial by fire because it was professional filmmakers and I was not prepared <laughs> um, but it was wonderful it was wonderful and I've been working with them off and on since um so I always try to tell people who are interested in getting into the industry just make a film even if it's cell phone camera and your best friend the best thing you can do is just get your work out there um and also zoom has been a great help we the for page and screen accepts video submissions so far we've received a couple that are actual on camera films but the majority are zoom films and those are just as fantastic i mean we published one in the same issue you were published in i believe by brian petty and it's sure. so cool it's so cool i i don't know i've never i never thought about doing a zoom film as a filmmaker myself, I never thought about it, but seeing them is they're so creative. They're so fun. There's one called, um, Oh, give me one second. It's going to take me host. There's a zoom horror film. That's maybe about an hour long, a little bit over called host. That's really good. And actually scary. If you have the chance to see that, um, okay. you made me think of it. Cause you also, you said zoom films and then also you worked on, the uh the killer clown movie now we had emailed a little bit and you had mentioned a stage it and stream it collection i would love for you to talk about that since we're on the topic of plays and streaming and all of that sure so um one of the things i've been able to do over the last handful of years is to edit um anthologies for applause theater and cinema books um, with thanks to my agent, uh, June Clark from the fine print literary management. And I edited a collection of festival plays from 2015. I then co-edited with William Damasti's the best American short plays, um, 20, I think that was 2015, 2016. I can't remember the dates now. Then I edited the best American short plays, 2018, 2019. And that title went on hiatus. It sometimes does depending on the marketplace for for collections and i was asked well is there something that you would like to pitch to us and i had seen so much virtual theater as um a respondent for different organizations as an audience member from being a part of different workshops and theater communities and, and different companies and i said i would love to put together a book of plays for online platforms and um Something that I say in the introduction is that playwrights have always demonstrated an incredible adaptability, able to nimbly adjust to new circumstances and media. And I stand by that 100%. So if you look at a lot of our 21st century playwrights, they actually are writing television right now because they understand that's where a lot of, that's basically where the living is, but they still want the life that's in the theater. Um, and in the pandemic and lockdown, we didn't stop. And I say that for all of us, all theater folks, we didn't stop making our art. We just adapted. 
you know, this thing, this is a thing that would not die. You know, Aristotle all but declared theater dead back in the poetics. And here we are, you know, over 2000 years later, it's a slow death. It is. Um, but I think that in the pandemic in particular, we adjusted to ways to use new technologies to present live art. And if you watched any Zoom theater, you know there's a huge learning curve in those early times where it was just kind of folks reading a script, not really much going on in the background, to later having much more elaborate productions, particularly if you had people that were quarantining together in a space where they can do things with sets, do things with effects on their computers. Um, so I said, yes, I want to do a, a, a book of um, virtual theater. Because one of two things will happen. One is virtual theater will be seen as a form of theater that continues. And if you look at Bard at the Gate and some of the programming coming out of spaces like the McCarter Theater under Paula Vogel um, or other spaces, um, that yes, very much we are we are here for Zoom theater. And that's a little bit different than what the National Theater does with their online theater productions where it's basically recording a play. And a little bit different than what... Um, Broadway does sometimes like with the, you know, the, the Disney recording of Hamilton It's more that, no, no, we're, we're writing now for this space where the little, little screen is your stage and how do you move around? Um, there's even an awards, the, the young house awards um, for online performances. And um, we say zoom theater was really any, any online platform. So I, I pitched this book, a collection of 20 plays, including monologues, 10 minute plays, longer one acts and a couple of full lengths and um, applause liked it. They were, uh, they were on board. And so that book is forthcoming on uh, June 1st. I hope people read it. I hope people like it. There are some great playwrights in there. And um, I should mention the playwrights real quick, because if I don't, they might get upset. Um, so um, the playwrights in there include, um, Audrey Cephaly, Joyce Miller, J. Merrill Motts, Arlene Hutton, Greg Lamb, Vince Gatton, Lindsay Adams, Cherise Selim, Rinalini Kamath, Brendan Powers, and Rachel uh, Bertram, who are Tiny Theater. If you've ever seen Tiny Theater, they broadcast basically out of their closet every Wednesday live. Um, Dana Hall, Ali Cantor, uh, Kit Lavoy, Jenny Lynn Bader, um, Ivan Cabril and Rodolfo Garcia Vasquez, Michael Higgins, Trey Tatum, and, and Jordan uh, Trevilian, um, Paulette Mazunek, uh, Tori Parker, Eric Eidson, Laura Lynch. Uh, it's a great collection of really great playwrights. And my apologies to you all if I have mispronounced your name. I, I'm so curious. Uh, Dana Hall is mm -hmm. also the name of one of the playwrights who wrote the podcast that we produced for our first episode of our pot of our podcast um i'm so curious if that's her that would be a wonderful coincidence <laughs> yeah ours is a small world um we all know each other i mean i i don't do social media outside of facebook and um mostly because i like to argue with other middle-aged men about <laughs> politics uh I'm I kid. I just say good morning and show a picture of me drinking coffee or like having come out of the gym like everybody's dad does on Facebook. But um, yeah, ours is a small world and we have groups like the Playwright Connection and um, Playwrights Thriving and we're all a part of these groups together. Um, and Dana Hall is wonderful and very supportive. Um, but I think most of us are very supportive. Um, I don't see many egos with with playwrights. Um, and the few that I have don't last long because you, you do it for the art. I mean, it would be nice to do it for the money too and for the fame, but very few people stay to get into playwriting for money and respect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I feel like it's such a collaborative space too, that you kind of need that. You need to be supportive in order to have that community to support you, support them. It's just a very collaborative space. Absolutely. I guess my final question for you, I, I might tack on a bonus, but my final oh. non-bonus question for you is 
um, the what's next question. And you've already answered that with uh, this collection, but do you have anything else you're working on? Anything in the wings? I know you have to let us know if your film goes to any festivals that we can stream or plug online, something like that. But So our short film, Escapism, is directed by Greg Bray, stars Joseph Anthony Davis, Willis Williams, and Jake Hunsbusher. And that is going First, to the Talking It Out Film Festival, which is a virtual film festival on May 5th. And the other film festival, or other festival, I should say, coming up is that it will be part of the Music Movies and Mic Drop Festival later this calendar year. Uh, and uh, hopefully it will continue being shown at festivals uh, around the country. It's eight minutes long, and I adapted it from a stage play. I wrote a, a full-length stage play called Friendly's Fire, which won the Appalachian Festival of Plays and Playwrights at Barter Theater in 2015. And then Barter produced it in 2017. And then a group, Rising Sun Performance Company, produced it at the, four, the theater at the 14th Street Y in 2019. Um, that's since been published by Next Stage Press. And I was curious to see if we could adapt that into a film. Um, the long story short, a long story long, is that in 2021, summer of, I was approached by a director, independent director named John Niederer, and he had seen some of my stuff, and he asked if I could write a short horror film. So in about a month, I wrote three. One was a vampire film, one was a werewolf film, and one was um, uh, an adaptation of Friendly Spire in eight minutes. And I told him he could choose one. He took the vampire film. And then my brother took um, escapism, what became escapism. And um, and then the third one, the werewolf thing, I kind of sp spun a little bit into St. John of Suburbia, just kind of lived there and then kind of came out later. Um, so, uh, so all three properties got used, which is a cool thing. And uh, yeah, escapism, we're having a lot of fun with it. It's a fun piece. It's kind of kind of weird, kind of offbeat. Um, kind of a, a love letter to He-Man action figures and uh, kind of a love letter to a couple of my friends who served in the military. I never served in the military, but two of my closest friends did and uh, who are still with us, thank God. And uh, yeah, we've, we've been having a ball with it. So it, that will be at the Talking It Out Festival and um, and then later in the year, the MMM Music Movies Mic Drop Festival. Awesome. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so my bonus question for you is if you had any advice for writers trying to get into th this space, what would it be? Well, uh, first thing, make sure you're actually writing. The hardest thing is writing. Dorothy Parker once said, I don't like writing. I like having written. So know that if the process sometimes feels grueling, that that's normal, uh, but make sure you're writing. Um, if you're a young theater person, um, go to local theaters, go to community theater, go talk to people who are actors, see if you can volunteer somewhere, see if there's a way you can join a theater company. Don't just show up with your script. Just, just see if you can be part of the community. And if the community welcomes you, that's a good time to develop relationships that could lead to a reading of your script or a production of your script. If you're a filmmaker, if you're a young filmmaker, um, take your camera out into the world and just make short videos with friends, see what people are doing on online platforms. Chances are young people know much more about technology than I know. I have a 14 year old son and a nine and a nine year old daughter. And um, they're so advanced in my opinion, they're so advanced. I have no idea what they're talking about. They're making their own video games. And I just sit there like, how'd that happen? So young folks already have the technology. The key is make sure that you're telling a story. Uh, know what your characters want, why this piece, um, why the circumstances in the story could only happen today and no other day. What makes today's event special and unlike any other day. And just take it from there and let your imagination guide you. As you move forward, uh, if you consider college, know that the great thing about college, wherever you go to college, it doesn't have to be um, the top tier college. I started off at a community college. 
Um, just you're going to be in a place where there are people with, with similar passions and a place where you're going to have to take out equipment or you're going to have access to rooms. You know, that's how you can shoot your own movie. That's how you can stage your own uh, piece, your own performance piece. So make sure that you make those connections in college and meet people who speak a similar language. It's wild. Um, and I will say that escapism and the vampire piece, Bar Barflies, could not have happened without the generous support of an old college friend, Joshua Kreitzman, who, who is because of him that these things could happen. That he saw these scripts, and he saw me and my brother were doing something. He said, "Yeah, let me help you guys out." So those connections are are very important. And he's a friend. I mean, it's not like he's we're we're all friends. Like that's that's instrumental to making sure you move forward. And even if you're not in a position where friends can help you financially, they can still show up and you know hold a light or just see your show or see your movie, or whatever. And that's that's great. Absolutely, absolutely. That's great. It is great. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's been great talking to you. Great meeting you. Sure, this was fun.